Good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone joining us today. My name is Jessica Taylor. I'm here at the Canadian Centre for Evidence-Based Conservation in Ottawa, Canada. On behalf of the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence, I'd like to welcome you all to our February instalment uh, for our Environmental Evidence Summit webinar series. Today's special session, uh, Evidence Co-Production and Use in Environmental Policy and Practice Processes in Africa, will be chaired by Karina Van Royen and Cecilia Njenga. So to get things started, I will hand it over to you, Cecilia. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's indeed my great pleasure to once again invite you uh, to this uh, seminar. Our title is Evidence Co-Production and Using Environmental Policy and Processes. And I'd just like to emphasize that today's session will mainly focus on South Africa, and we will be listening uh, and, and uh, interacting with four panelists. And Karina, Dr. Karina, will come uh, towards the end uh, to facilitate a conversation uh, and draw some of the messages emerging from this uh, discussion. This afternoon, we shall be exploring a couple of issues in this discourse. What are the key motivations or evidence informed decision making? Uh, we will uh, highlight aspects including effective policies and practices. Uh, we will explore the importance of transparency and accountability frameworks of, of decision making and also look at the importance of evidence informed decision making uh, to ensure equity, inclusion and sustainability outcomes. These are all more relevant in a resource constraint constraint such as where we will be discussing in the context of South Africa. I, my name is Cecilia Jenga and I am the head of the UNEP office uh, here in South Africa. In UNEP, we believe in the importance of bridging the gap between the producers and the users of environmental inf information and work to improve knowledge management, data sharing and environmental reporting uh, for evidence-based decision-making. To keep the world's environment under check, policymakers and researchers, including involving concerned citizens, can track local levels of air pollution, for instance, monitor resource use, and access maps, publication, and other resources. But importantly, environmental data gaps remain. Therefore, what role can EIDM play to close the evidence and data gaps and improve the tracking of progress and so much more now that we only have 10 years uh, to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals and other international agreed goals and targets, what is it that EIDM can contribute in enabling us fill this gap? So effective ethical and effective EIDM requires that the production and the use of high quality evidence is timely, is relevant and is structured. And one way to do so is what we'll be, we will be discussing today is what we call co-production, sometimes referred as co-creation and by others as co-design. And we'll be focusing on environmental evidence and we'll be considering key tools of addressing complex global environmental challenges from climate change to biodiversity, uh, biodiversity uh, conservation. In this set webinar, we will discuss cases of how evidence is intentionally co-produced and used in the making and implementation of biodiversity, as I said, and climate change mitigation policy processes in South Africa. So I would like to invite, and I will be introducing the, the panelists as I invite them to make their interventions. So please relax, take out your pen, and let's engage uh, in what I promise you to be a very, very productive, enlightening um, and interactive session uh, for the next few minutes. So at this point, I would like to introduce the first presentation, uh, and this will focus on scopy, scoping the review of responsive or rapid evidence synthesis services. Uh, and the presenter and panelist uh, will be Natalie Tanus, uh, from the Africa Center for Evidence, not popularly known as ACE. So Natalie, I would like to invite you uh, to make uh, your presentation. Welcome, Natalie. 
Thank you so much, Cecilia, for that introduction. I'm very happy to be here today to um, share the results of our scoping review around rapid evidence synthesis services. I just want to check to ensure that everyone can see my screen. Yep, it looks fine, Natalie. Great. Thanks very much, Jess. So, um, Our scoping review was really as part of an effort to develop a responsive evidence synthesis service, specifically for South African environmental decision makers. Um, the idea was for the service to operate outside, um, to rather operate from the Collaboration for Environmental Evidences Johannesburg Centre, which is hosted here in Johannesburg by the Africa Centre for Evidence, based at the University of Johannesburg. Wow, that's a lot of names. <laughs> so we have as a, our mission uh, to reduce inequality and poverty through the use of research evidence for decisions. Importantly, our starting point at ACE in the process of supporting evidence-informed decision-making is the decision-maker herself. With decision-makers as our starting point to guide us with what research evidence is needed for policy decisions, we wanted to develop a service that uses evidence synthesis methodology in a timely way so that we could respond to decision-makers' evidence needs. We knew of rapid evidence assessments and similar services and tools that, were, that offer um, evidence syntheses like these from around the world but we wanted to ensure that we understood the applicability of such services to our specific South African environmental context. And importantly, we also wanted to understand whether services could be structured to provide evidence in a way that enhanced credibility, legitimacy and relevance of that evidence and of that service for decision makers. And so we undertook a scoping review of such services from around the world. For our scoping review, we searched three sources of information, 15 academic databases that used explicit search strings using Boolean operators, Google Scholar using keyword searches, and also snowballing through the reference lists of included papers. We used keywords or rather constructed our search string using keywords related to the concept of rapid response service. And from over 5,000 results, we applied our inclusion criteria and were left with 39 studies discussing, <laughs> discussing rather, these services from around the world. Some of the key findings that are relative, relevant to our search and to our discussion here, and also to our effort to create a demand-led evidence synthesis service for decision makers, were that um, these services were found predominantly in high-income settings. They occurred around the world, but they existed primarily again in the health sector. Interestingly, though, they were uh, the second sector that was where these reserves most frequently appeared was the environmental sector. But again, all of these reserves were still Europe-based. Others, we came across a lot of work where others had studied reserves. Um, but ours was the first extensive scoping review to study reses that followed an evidence synthesis approach. Other findings from our review that can that we sort of pulled out were the way, different ways in which uh, terminology was reported within the studies. This included referring to things like a rapid review or a rapid health technology assessment in the health sector, all the way through to a rapid evidence assessment in the environmental sector. We also looked at the variety of products that these different services offered. This included everything from an evidence inventory or a rapid response all the way through to a rapid full systematic review. We also pulled out the ways in which um, teams streamlined their methods in order to provide evidence syntheses in a timely way. This included things like limiting the scope of the review question or narrowing the number of sub-questions included in the review. And then finally, importantly for us, we wanted to get a sense of what user feedback uh, was. So we looked, um, for example, any studies that reported what was reported as critical in operationalizing the service. 
keeping in mind that this exploration, the scoping review, was really to inform how we tried to build and develop a, a rapid evidence synthesis service at our own centre. So armed with this picture of different resas from around the world, we reflected about what this all meant for how we would design our rapid evidence synthesis service. At the same time, we were fortunate enough to be given the opportunity to run a small pilot of how we thought the res would function. And what we learned was really, really interesting. I'll speak now about the three domains that we feel make for effective evidence informed decision making and how they relate or how we see them as relating to our res service. So first of all is credibility. When using a RES tool or when using a rapid evidence synthesis service as a tool to support decisions with evidence, it's foundational that not only the evidence itself is seen as credible, but also that the team offering the service is seen as credible by the people we're hoping will use the service. For us, this has meant that we use evidence synthesis as a tool to provide evidence that is credible and rigorous, as well as relevant, but also that we place an emphasis on relationship building through the process of offering a res. When the starting point of offering a service to support decisions with evidence synthesis is the decision maker's need, the service as well as the product are more likely to be relevant for that specific decision maker. So when we were trying to, when we were trying to build our res to be uh, relevant and to sure, ensure that it provides relevant service, it actually prompted us to move away from talking about a rapid evidence synthesis service to talking about a responsive evidence synthesis service. The need of the policymaker is what guides our responsiveness. From our perspective, a thoroughly rigorous piece of evidence that misses a policy window or the opportunity to inform decisions is a wasted chance to contribute towards our center's mission of reducing poverty and inequality in South Africa and Africa. Finally, legitimacy. Trisha Greenhall, and I confess I am a fan, but Trisha Greenhall describes legitimacy as the degree to which one's research is accepted amongst a diverse set of actors and is thus there, uh, useful for a set of social actions. So the idea of legitimacy around a, a re, an evidence synthesis service is that a decision maker who feels listened to and heard is far more likely to see the research process or the service offered or the product produced as legitimate, as a legitimate source of information to draw on for their decision making needs. A final finding that we came across both in our scoping review as well as our pilot was the usefulness for a res to be effective um, is very much dependent on the existence of an evidence base from which one can timelessly draw relevant research in a rigorous way. And I think that here some of our panelists will be speaking to, to this finding in a different way. I'd like to conclude with a reminder that uh, for us, a res is only one of many tools that we think supports effective science policy practice mm -hmm. interface. Um, and we really look forward to engaging about your experiences of offering or making use of reses as they relate particularly to the three domains of legitimacy, relevance and credibility. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie, for that uh, very interesting uh, presentation. From rapid assessment to more responsive evidence, uh, which is backed by a robust methodology uh, and embraces the principles of credibility and legitimacy, but much more so in terms of ensuring co-production builds relationships with those that are involved and are part and parcel of these processes. I think that's really underlines uh, one of the key elements uh, that Natalie uh, was able to share with us. And I hope that you can all continue reflecting on this uh, as I call on uh, the next presenter uh, who will be building on uh, the case for evidence informed decision making. It's now indeed my pleasure to in invite the second panelist, um, Mr. Promise Nduku, who will be talking uh, on the topic co-production of a policy relevant evidence map of South African environmental evidence. 
our welcome promise. Uh, please go ahead and make your presentation. Um, thank you so much, Cecilia. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just jump uh, straight into it. And I think this is more of uh, um, an extension to, to Natalie's presentation, which whom I, I must appreciate for, for the lovely introduction uh, to the process. So my, 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 the focus of my presentation is on the co-production of, of, of in, in the South African environmental evidence map that uh, we are still in the process of, of developing. And just to highlight um, the co-production aspect and how it speaks to the three domains that, um, that uh, Natalie has introduced. Um, this is just an outline of uh, the structure of this presentation. So I'll firstly discuss um, in bring policy relevant evidence maps, and then uh, just a quick snapshot of, of the South African ev environmental evidence map itself in terms of the framework. Then also uh, discuss the domains of, of the science policy um, uh, practice interface and, and finally conclude. So I think the first starting point in terms of um, this discussion around uh, co-production of this policy relevant uh, South African environmental evidence map is just to maybe sort of like um, uh, give what I'll call a, a, a comparison uh, between the steps of uh, evidence involved in, in evidence mapping and, and how they've been adopted in terms of uh, policy relevant evidence mapping. Um, so on the left hand side, we have these six key steps and, and um, of, of evidence mapping and on the right hand side is um, basically seven steps involved in, in, in policy relevant evidence mapping. But, but what is key, I think, is, is, is to highlight how this policy relevant evidence mapping, and this is important for us to note because it will speak to those um, three domains, uh, the fact that it follows a systematic review uh, methodology, right? And uh, um, there are slight differences, uh, but um, largely, um, this, this, uh, these two processes are very much comparable. I think the key differences will be the terminology. For instance, if, I, if we look at the first step, what we in conventional um, uh, evidence mapping, what we call clarifying the scope and the question uh, when it comes to policy relevant evidence mapping, this is basically uh, you know, developing the policy narrative. Um, and, and, and this is a very key step um, uh, in, in, in the public sector, you know, in terms of the, developing the policy narrative, what it entails is, is basically conceptualizing how the evidence map is supposed to be used and what mandate it requires, you know, to enter existing and future policy debates. It also, you know, involves identifying a policy custodian or champion uh, of, of uh, to champion the, the, the evidence map and, and support its use as well as, you know, its integration in the, in the decision making process. And, and uh, I, must, I must say, it, it really requires, you know, extensive stakeholder engagement and integration of the evidence map into, into the wider government structures and tools. Um, uh, for us here at ACE, we always, our stance is always to align, you know, these policy relevant evidence mapping with, you know, key policy documents, form of frameworks. Uh, for instance, the, in, in, uh, the National Development Plan, I would just um, maybe <coughs> give uh, uh, an example at, uh, during the, the later stages of, of the presentation. So just to uh, continue here, I think the first two steps here, the policy narrative and deciding on the, on the evidence, which is uh, um, very comparable, comparable to the second step, uh, uh, um, the deciding on the, of the evidence is very comparable to you know, um, uh, the steps, uh, second step in terms of finding, for finding the, 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 the evidence and the inclusion criteria in terms of the steps involved in, 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 in you know, uh, carrying out conventional evidence mapping. These are the strategic policy component um, uh, in terms of the policy relevant evidence, policy relevant evidence mapping process. And these are the stages, systematic research, the extraction and, and critical place of this evidence, more the technical research component and the presentation visualization, that's the uh, technical or IT component. And of course, the most important uh, step which is the user engagement, you know, and the use of, of that map, which is basically the, the stakeholder component. And I must emphasize at this point that for policy relevant evidence mapping, the stakeholder engagement, um, one of the key stakeholders is 
the policymakers themselves and they're actually involved in the whole process. Again, this will speak to uh, the, the components or the domains uh, as I'll highlight uh, later, later on. Uh, and then um, speaking about the um, South African evidence map itself, um, this is just highlighting the, the inclusion criteria, what we found or what we decided is relevant for, for to be included in, in, in this map. Uh, it's focusing in, in uh, focus on research in, in, South Af in South Africa, the first key thing. And uh, again, I think this will speak to uh, the domain of relevance that we're looking at, you know, uh, studies that are published in from 2010 up to up to this current point. And obviously they're focusing on the environment. So here it's just a, a snapshot of, of uh, uh, the South African evidence mapping frame, uh, framework. Um, because this, this map is actually developed in a, in a, in a uh, in a matrix framework. So on the right hand side, that will be on the vertical axis. Uh, what we see are the key uh, intervention, the key intervention areas that were identified by both this, you know, co production processes, stakeholder engagement between uh, the researchers, us and the policymakers. And on the right hand side, on the horizontal axis, these are the key areas. Like I said earlier on, we always try uh, as much as possible that you know, we align with key policy documents and frameworks uh, or structures and tools. So those are the key priority areas within the Empire South African environment. And that's how this um, uh, framework was developed. Then moving on to uh, the models, um, uh, the science policy practice interface. I think it's, for the, 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 one key point to, to, to put across there is that the manner in which this evidence mapping is produced is fits within, um, uh, it fits into co-production, right? In the sense that we believe that science and policy can be merged, right? And whilst these linkages between uh, these two are not really linear, but you know, it's a complex system, the idea is that it's not just about the production side, uh, but the use side. So it's not essential about, okay, let's keep producing, producing evidence. Um, the policymakers themselves need to be, need to, need to be involved. And, and, and so the uniqueness of, of, of this map is that we will support evidence used through the use of this evidence map and also rapid uh, response services as a mechanism as a mechanism to enhance the use of evidence in the policy making processes. And um, so now speaking to this domain and how we see you know co-production uh, sort of like uh, being in line or in tandem with, with, with the three domains that we that we discussed earlier. Credibility. Firstly, as we've seen uh, when I was highlighting the steps that are involved, uh, it follows a rigorous systematic review process. So five, we feel that you know this is uh, it enhances yeah, its credibility. Uh, we produce this with uh, user in mind, you know, uh, uh, in terms of the co-production process, and then in terms of relevance, uh, this co-production continuous engagement with the policymakers throughout the whole process it ensures relevance. And that it is always informed by the needs of the user. Uh, the framework that I just highlighted there uh, is informed by the policymakers themselves. And uh, in terms of legitimacy, I think the continuous involvement of policymakers actually what it does is it provides that sense of ownership for the for the end user and that gives it that legitimacy. Um, and so just to highlight here at this point as we carry out this process, uh, the key question that we'll be asking is, so what counts as ro robust evidence in, in this process, right? What is considered relevant? Uh, the key point to highlight is the importance of great literature. It's not only about, you know, purely to view general articles, but, you know, uh, uh, great literature is also in, in, important. So for this process, we actually search 
uh, we actually carry, carry out not really literature searches on the international and local website. So a range of, of evidence is actually considered uh, considered important here. Just uh, another point to make. Uh, so what you see here is basically the cycle of policy making. Just point to emphasize that um, based one based on on the feedback from the policymakers itself, from the policymakers themselves. Sorry, um, this evidence normally or what others might actually think is maybe uh, evidence can only be used maybe the planning stages or maybe at the agenda setting stages. In actual fact they would actually want to see this evidence being used in the whole process, and it actually can be used in the whole policy cycle. Uh, so this is uh, just one example that I just highlight, uh, I spoke about earlier on. Uh, this is uh, basically an evidence map that we, we produced uh, in, 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 in 2019 uh, in response to the, to the request by, by the presidents around land reform. And it, like I said, it, it followed all those, you know, processes, a continuous uh, engagement with the policymakers uh, in the core production exercise. And then um, what, what you basically see here, this is actually based on, on policymakers uh, feedback, I said we thought we carried out some time ago in terms of, you know, the how they found uh, uh, the policy relevant evidence mapping. Uh, evidence may be useful for them. So uh, basically there are eight uses that the fund. I won't really discuss all of them because of, of time, but just to maybe engage in, in, in one, like for instance, if they, they, based on their responses, they felt that, you know, this evidence may can actually be used as a research tool, you know, to identify gaps, you know, in the patterns, in the coverage and the patterns in the available evidence on the, on the policy question. And uh, I must say, uh, on this land reform uh, project, this is how the, 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 this uh, evidence map was actually used in terms of you know, identifying the gaps uh, in the coverage. So maybe what a, a, a map could show is that you know, there's, a, there's a gap in a particular area, there's no evidence there. What do you do uh, in commission research in, in that specific area? And as, as, as a conclusion, uh, essentially with this exercise uh, that we're creating, uh, we actually want to show that we can actually produce policy level and evidence map that are really up to date, that are focused, they that, uh, follow systematic review process and speak to, you know, the rigor uh, in the process that are accessible uh, because of this policy, you know, uh, relevant evidence map like all the other evidence made that we produce that are easily shareable, and they're also useful in the sense that um, through this core progression exercise, they speak to all these three uh, domains of cred credibility, relevance, credibility, relevance, and, and legitimacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Promise, um, also for expounding on the policy relevant evidence ma mapping framework uh, that you have developed, the various steps uh, and the inclusion criteria. Uh, but very interestingly, you know, the whole concept of the science push policy pool and therefore demanding for a much more collaboration and co-production and co-design uh, between the policymakers uh, and the scientists, the generators of evidence, et cetera. Uh, and I do like you continuing to underlie some of the key principles of policy relevance, of credibility, of legitimacy, uh, et cetera. Would really like to thank you uh, for that. Uh, participants, as we continue, I just want to remind you as we proceed uh, that as we explore, you know, these different methods, approaches, mechanisms, um, when what we continue to learn from these domains, that you continue to reflect. Uh, and we are inviting you as we move on uh, to provide some commentary on the domains of what you, what you perceive as effective evidence policy practice, uh, interfaces uh, such as credibility, the whole issue of trust, relevance, timeliness, clarity, and legitimacy. Uh, I will now be welcoming our third panelist, 
Um, and um, her name uh, is um, Ms. Mapula Shangela. Uh, Mapula will be speaking to us uh, on the topic of co-produced synthesized evidence on climate change mitigation implementation in South Africa. Uh, Mapula Shangela is from the South Africa National Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries. Uh, welcome, Mapula. Thank you, uh, Ms. Njenga, and good morning, uh, good day, and good afternoon to different participants at this point. And thank you for joining us today. Um, we really grateful for having time with you to share with, with you our experiences on evidence used uh, in a government department. Um, so our project actually draws from uh, what uh, Natalie and Liqua had just shared uh, with you just now. Um, so what we have done is after they have done, uh, or we have collectively developed a, an evidence map for the environment sector, which was a first of its kind, um, we then uh, explored together with them the rest. We tested that. So what I'm sharing with you is a reflection from, from our, myself as from a policy perspective. Um, so what we did is um, we looked at the evidence map itself as it was generated. So I am uh, the director for climate change mitigation uh, implementation. So I challenged them and I said, okay, uh, from the sphere which I'm uh, operating in, what can we say about the evidence? What evidence is available uh, in terms of the work that I need to be doing? Um, so subsequently, and by the way, also, um, this is an ongoing project uh, or partnership that we've been having, which I think it's something that is key for anyone who wants to engage in co-production uh, related as early as 2014. Um, so if you are interested in this space, you need to know that you need to invest more time uh, in that aspect. Um, anyway, so what we have done is we then uh, jointly scoped uh, what is it that we want to um, know about climate change mitigation implementation out of the evidence based or the evidence map that is there. Um, and then we jointly scoped the, the, the questions that we had. Uh, so, so from the UJ team, we had people like Karina, we also had Liqua, we had Meto at some point uh, working with us uh, in that project. Uh, and once we've done that, we then went into the evidence map and we um, applied the criteria, the search criteria, we found about 150 studies that related to climate change mitigation implementation, actually climate change broadly. And then we applied the include and exclusion criteria because we were interested more on the implementation side. We then uh, said we want specifically to look at what is available on implementation. Um, and interestingly, after we applied the filter, uh, 35 studies came out uh, which were based on the criteria that we had were relevant um, for talking to climate change uh, mitigation implementation. Um, so what we found then useful uh, with this process then is um, we, we, we were able to find two things. The one is from a process point of view and the second one is from a content point of view. So from a process point of view, it is certainly a co-production process. And from a content point of view, there were several things that we were able to pick up uh, as a government department, which are useful for use of evidence. Uh, so firstly, we were able to confirm the sectors that are coming up in the mitigation implementation uh, what, what people are studying about South Africa in as far as the sectors, the energy, the agriculture. Uh, we even found studies that relate to tourism um, in that aspect. But also what was key is we were also able to find studies that related to uh, multi-level governance. So we were able to see what the evidence is telling us about the role of national uh, sub-national as well as local government in as far as climate change, we were able to see um, the dynamics around the tensions and the opportunities um, 
and the clarity of roles in, in that aspect. Um, we also were able to see the type of instruments that are being talked about when climate change uh, mitigation is talked about. Interestingly, we also saw uh, relationship also with the waste uh, instruments as well as air quality instrument and these were key also because for, for for South Africa for example in terms of climate change it's only now that we are in the process of finalizing a, a, an act so at the moment we are operating with policies and plans and strategies but in as far as the climate change dedicated act um, that is still in progress and therefore seeing how other instruments are seen from a climate change perspective was also useful for us uh, and overall we were able to synthesize that in terms of opportunities challenges and barriers uh, that are coming out but what was key also through the process we were able to also point out then to the researchers um, team in terms of the research evidence gaps so we were able to see areas that are not covered uh, that are relevant. And this is important because we find that often government is criticized for not implementing, but put, put differently, we are now saying, but there is no evidence that relates to uh, implementation. And therefore that brings a challenge to even the researchers themselves to say, not only focus on um, the, the upstream uh, policy decision making, but also at implementation level, we need research uh, evidence to, to take place. A quick reflection on the three areas that uh, Natalie spoke about, as well as LIQA, in terms of credibility, legitimacy, and relevance. Um, so uh, credibility, I, I think I can say the way we view it, I can start by saying I, for one, subscribe to transdisciplinary and boundaries boundary spanning research approaches and therefore credibility from, from my side, I'm able to reflect it in, a, in as far as a researcher who's able to consciously uh, move across uh, being a change agent, but also being conscious of the scientific methods and be able to indicate why certain uh, methods are being followed and procedures are being followed. Uh, and, and hence that was useful for us in the co-production but also um, in terms of having clear method, I think, yes. But just checking that your, your, your slide has moved and um, I think it's still on the first one. Yeah, no, I've picked up that it's not moving, so I'm not sure why. So I have moved <laughs> to, I'm, I'm on the last slide now. <laughs> so it's not moving, I'm not sure why. <laughs> so um, yeah, then legitimacy and relevance, for us, we took the legitimacy in terms of, we have a long standing processes that were started, for example, by our Department of Science and Innovation, as well as Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, but as well as also my department where, so we, we the, the co-production and evidence informed is legitimized through such departments, uh, commitments and policies, which then uh, by implications are also government-wide legitimization of what we are doing. In terms of the relevance also, we find that um, both in terms of uh, the, the, the climate change relevance, in terms of responding to the climate change response by government department, but also taking to uh, context the relevance in terms of how then we are able to, on a day-to-day -day hours, able to, during the process, reflect on the lessons that were coming out from the, um, the, the study itself, the co-production process, I was able to engage with my colleagues on a day-to-day -day using the evidence that I was uh, receiving from that. So there was relevance demonstrated. In terms of the, then another legitimacy is having partnerships in place, such as our department and, and the Africa Center for Evidence having a, a strategic partnership in place. So that legitimizes the work that we're doing. And in terms of timeliness, the evidence map, uh, the fact that it was existent um, made it easier also for us to quickly be able to work with the, with the evidence that we had. But I think um, the important thing on timeliness is that then it means one needs to invest much longer term in terms of having that system in place before then it can even be used. Um, but yeah, in conclusion, that is a practical case that we had uh, of co-producing 
the evidence in the climate change implementation, where we explored the re re rapid response service, as well as the use of the evidence map. Um, it's not an easy process, but it's, it's long term and it requires a lot of commitment um, and, and, and willingness to learn in the process. But also I was saying to, to the researchers, the willingness to also take um, negative messages. So the evidence that we were finding uh, and, and being able to take it on as, as policymakers, as a feedback, I think. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Makula, for sharing with us uh, this very practical example uh, and also emphasizing, you know, the importance of uh, feedback, uh, both positive and negative, and its importance in building much more credible evidence, but also buy-in uh, in the process of conversation between the policymakers and the scientists or the researchers in this case. Thanks for elaborating more the application of a framework that looks at process but also content and ensures principles of legitimacy, uh, credibility and relevance are embedded uh, in that process. Indeed, the long-term commitment uh, and willingness to learn are critical elements um, that should be enshrined uh, as we genuinely develop uh, this collaboration and move towards a co-production process. Thank you very much, Mapula. I will now be moving to invite uh, our fourth panelist, our fourth panelist is Dr. Kiruben Naika. Uh, Dr. Kiruben Naika is from the South Africa National Government Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries. Uh, and Dr. Naika will be speaking to us this afternoon about co-creation in natural capital accounting leadership. It's indeed my pleasure to invite you, Kiruben, uh, to make your presentation. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Cecilia, for that introduction. And thank you again for this opportunity to um, present on, on this panel. Um, this work is, uh, uh, was, is based on my uh, PhD study that I conducted last year whilst holding the portfolio of the director for the science policy in interface and information management. Um, so very, very relevant to uh, the work, the policy work that is um, being un undertaken at the moment. So, um, yeah, so this is, uh, I mean, uh, a world in turmoil. I mean, we, we all are very familiar with the uh, image on, on our far uh, left. Um, there's climate change happening, there's land degradation, biodiversity loss. Um, security of our food systems are under threat. Um, population growth is a, is a problem. And then all that uh, together with the uh, onset of the industrial, um, you know, fourth industrial revolution, these complex issues are creating a radically different and diverse context for the present leadership in society. The need for, uh, co uh, for leadership co-creation so uh, what what all these complex um, uh, situations in the world have have made us realize is that there are close interconnections between people and nature there's dependencies on nature and services wide scale in in equity have we have uh, have uh, uh, surfaced and um, environment is degrad uh, is degrading um, and sustainability is a major risk so leaders need to increasingly work in multidisciplinary collaborative ways to integrate their interests and, uh, and co-create. And that's where uh, this whole uh, research came together in terms of finding the nexus between co-creation leadership in the context of natural capital accounting. So why and what of the co-creation? So the role of, uh, of co-creation um, has been, uh, was really unclear in the whole leadership space. Uh, it, it was taking place at a macro level and particularly in the, in the biodiversity sector, um, we've been a, a receiving environment for collaboration, for uh, innovation, creativity, and um, uh, the legislation also makes for robust consultation as well. So um, my colleagues uh, on the panel spoke about, uh, Mapula spoke about um, process, uh, 
um, and um, Pramas also spoke about the, the National Development Plan. Uh, there's the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan and a host of other policy and decision support tools that actually um, focus a lot on process of uh, consultation and engagement with, with, uh, with the society at large. There's also the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. This is a science policy platform and it conducts scientific assessments and accompanying these scientific, uh, robust scientific assessments is a summary for policymakers, which is emerging as a, a key tool or mechanism to actually bring together both the, the scientists and the, uh, the policymakers. So in terms of uh, co-creation it, uh, itself, this is a, a DART model uh, by Ramaswamy, and um, uh, it, it, it involves um, value at, at the heart of, of the co-creation model. And it involves uh, dialogue, uh, part of communication, transparency, access again, uh, access to information, and then it uh, also has an element of risk and the benefits as well. So um, this is a quotation. Uh, it's about the human experience. So co-creation is about the human experience. And he believes it has the power to change the future by creating a better world environment around us, which is badly needed in these times. So these times are very complex times at the moment that we are facing. So why use the case for uh, case context of natural capital accounting? Now, natural capital accounting is, is, a, is a, um, a tool, an uh, emerging tool that has been uh, conceptualized and evolved and evolving and still evolving to bring together the environment and the, the value of the environment, value of our natural resources together with e economics. And, and NCA uh, for short uh, was explored by resource economists to develop social welfare accounting. So NCA, its scope and definition is still being developed. And the reason why it was chosen as um, a case context to ex uh, explore co-creation and um, leadership is that because it has the, the traits of being multidisciplinary, multi-level, multi-dimensional, emergent and uh, evolutionary, it's expert-based, uh, stakeholder-driven, context-sensitive, value-based, and relational as well. It is now being pursued as a multidisciplinary accounting tool effective uh, to bring about a, a, um, transformative change in society. At the moment, more than 80 countries in the world are implementing uh, natural capital accounting, including South Africa. So this nexus um, between um, leadership and what it, uh, it comprises of together with co-creation uh, form, uh, form the basis of, uh, of the research. So um, the, the, um, the leadership model that was chosen for the research was relational leadership because it provides this continuum from um, hierarchical leadership to more uh, a, a socially constructed process. And um, the process is, is what it's all about, this process of leadership. It, it involves, it is purpose driven, it is context sensitive, it is based on relationships, it involves uh, communication, value creation, and emotion. Um, uh, it's inclusive, empowering, and obviously uh, also as well, uh, including the ethical debate. And then that um, um, uh, over, overlapped with the co creation uh, tenants or co creation elements. Uh, provided the basis for, for the uh, research. So the nexus uh, continues and when, when you, uh, you overlay relational leadership with all the, the traits, all the different traits uh, with, uh, and co-creation in the context of natural capital accounting, um, five uh, predefined themes emerged and this involved context, value creation, communication, partnerships and relationships, and emotion. So the, the research was a, a qualitative methodological uh, approach. It was based on, uh, it used a relational leadership theoretical framework 
and a social constructionist und understanding of the process uh, using discipline experts within the case context of natural capital accounting. And some of the results are from these predefined themes of context, um, uh, the, the dominant constru uh, construct was uh, complexity and uh, the dominant tenant emerging was ambiguity. From value creation as a, a one of the predefined themes, trust came, came out as the dominant construct. And this resonates well with, with what um, Natalie has been presenting, what um, Makula has been presenting, and uh, also promise as well, also indicated uh, the issue of credibility as well. And credibility came out as one of the dominant tenants that was interacting in the whole theme of uh, value creation. In terms of communication, uh, understanding emerged as the dominant construct. And the dominant tenant uh, in, in communication was conversation and dialogue. Uh, in the uh, predefined theme, uh, partnerships and relationships, interdependence and integration was, was integral to this the whole process. And um, in, uh, from that, um, structures and systems. So again, context came out uh, strongly uh, in this construct. And emotion, again, emotion was a surprise because um, uh, this emerged as one of the uh, key uh, constructs as well, where a willingness to participate and engage and, and collaborate came out strongly. And um, from the willingness to participate, uh, despite the complex um, and sad um, scenario that I uh, presented in the first um, and depressing, quite depressing scenario that I presented in the first slide, optimism actually emerged as a dominant tenant, which was actually quite surprising. This all, uh, all these tenants, dominant tenants, actually um, uh, showed us how co-creation was actually taking place within this context of natural capital accounting. And uh, what I, I, this is a, a model that was actually came out of the research, and it was it's based on the um, wedding cake uh, model of the SDGs that it, that was actually developed to better understand uh, uh, the the interlinkages or interdependencies of systems. And this was adapted by uh, Lucas and Wilting in 2018. So I'm not going to go through it in detail but it actually integrates all the, the, the different uh, dominant tenants and um, um, the predefined themes and actually creates this uh, co-creation model that actually can be applied across sectors. So some of the key principles emerging uh, from the research is that leadership is, it, it doesn't happen alone. It is interdependent on the interactions of all the tenants and, prom and it promotes and optimizes the co-creation process. As we have also heard uh, from Mapula, I think she mentioned um, uh, partnerships, relationships actually do matter in this whole co-creation uh, process. Um, you need to establish relevance of the, of the local context. Again, relevance uh, to, to society at, at large. It is very, very important, as well as not, not necessarily to, uh, to uh, the larger global society, but more to the locals, uh, local, local context is quite important. Establishing trust and, cre and building credibility um, is, is, is one of the principles that emerge. Transparency and inclusiveness promoting con um, conversation and dialogue as often as possible, developing strategic partners partnerships and relationships, and rewarding and, and incentivizing, and, and together with everything, promoting continuous co-creation. And this was what uh, came out of the research in terms of co-creation in a natural capital account uh, accounting leadership. So some of the recommendations for co-creation of, uh, um, of evidence-informed decision-making. Um, the research was restricted to experiences and observations of discipline experts. Um, it, it, I mean, it, it, uh, natural capital accounting is quite a, a small um, area of um, uh, expertise. I mean, there's a, a, a very few people that have this particular expertise because it is an emerging um, um, a mechanism or tool. 
but it, it, it actually brings together um, all different expertise. So, so that's what's uh, good about uh, natural capital accounting. Predefined themes may have restricted uh, the explore, uh, exploratory potential of the other themes and sub-themes. The research also focused on the positive effects of co-creation, but the negative impact of co-creation uh, co did emerge in the study, but were not developed further. Uh, the focus was more on the, the positive aspects. Co-creation co of evidence may promote buy-in ownership uptake, but politics and bias can undermine um, uh, the, the process. And I think that's my take home message, uh, 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 finally. Thank you very much. Um, thank you Great. very One much. Second. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kirubin, uh, for uh, sharing with us uh, very clearly your research, which indeed was of great interest to us, particularly in Africa, as we grapple uh, with understanding natural capital accounting model and how well this can be applied in policy and decision making, particularly uh, when we start valuing and taking cognizance of our natural resource base across Africa. So thanks very much for that and reminding us that at the core of this is the human experience and this providing us a power to change and creating a better experience for all and value system being at the core of the model that you applied for your PhD research. At this point, I'd like to hand over now uh, to Professor Karina Van Rooyen, uh, who will take it from here um, and facilitate further. So thank you very much and over to you, uh, Karina. Uh, wonderful, thanks, uh, Cecilia. And, um, I'm going to start by inviting the panelists. I'm just showing my face that you see I'm real, I'm not a bot. Uh, but I really want to ask the panelists if they want to switch on the mics of the, the um, cameras for us, um, as well as the, the mics. Um, right. Um, like I, would, I don't need to share that. Um, we can see that. Um, cool. So I think. Um, I'm looking and I'm inviting all of the attendees. If you have uh, particular questions, if you have points of clarity, um, please, if you want to put that in the um, question box for us, we will very happily and gladly, um, I, I'm very happy to post them to, to our panelists. Um, so I was wondering, I was really interested um, to, if I can start while I while I while um, questions are coming, um, I would like to hear from the panelists. Um, you presented various tools um, that we can use to really enhance, um, you know, science policy. And Kirubin always reminds me, practice interface. Is <laughs> um, so really how do we enhance evidence? Mm -hmm. so you, you presented, you know, co-creation. You presented co-creation in a rapid or responsive evidence synthesis service or co-creation by policy relevant evidence maps or, or you know, uh, various other reviews. So I'm wanting to hear from you and, and Kirabin also from your study, which I suspect you probably have quite a bit as well of. Can you tell us a little bit about what are the challenges that you can raise for us that those of us that are interested in, in making sure that we have research um, being relevant and used in policy processes? What are the challenges that you that you have from your tools or your cases that you can tell us about to to be wary of and to think of and to design for cool anyone happy that you go <laughs> uh, i can i can start to explain um <laughs> okay um so i think so some of the challenges is uh, first of all the there needs to be a, a, an establishment of the evidence base itself so to establish an evidence base you need you need costs you need uh human resources and they, they need also to have time um so but this becomes the initial challenges but once that is in place they are overcome and then it's just then the, the 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 challenge in terms of then how then do you update that evidence base, um, and but also of course other challenges that that 
that comes uh, practically may relate to as a, as a policy officer who then has to have also time to engage with the, with the research process. So you have to find a way of um, explaining why, why it, it, it is important for it to happen uh, that as part of doing policy, even evidence synthesis is exactly part of doing policy work as well. But I think it's a, it's a positive challenge, I suppose. Thanks. Promise? Okay, thank you. Um, so I think, yeah, um, we just highlight some 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 challenges that we we, we encountered, you know, in terms of uh, producing this uh, what I would call mega map. So um, uh, mega map in the sense that it, it it covers like the broader sector of of, of of the environmental sector, right? And in actual fact, these are like fourteen maps in one. Right, so the key challenge here is, is around, you know, um, the stakeholder agreement in terms of the framework, right? Because this is like an extensive map and it covers you know, several different areas, like I said, 14, 14 maps in one. Getting all these uh, different uh, uh, champions from these different sectors to agree on on, uh, on a framework is, is quite challenging. And secondly, I think also the, the, the amount of studies that you know, we had to deal with in terms from, from the screening, uh, we had more than uh, close to 200,000 studies, I think from, from the search results. Um, the screening process was quite, um, was quite uh, exhaustive. And uh, another challenge will be, you know, mapping um, uh, quite a number of, of, of studies. Uh, we still have to do, deal with, uh, you know, our ways around uh, the kind of softwares that we use and the number of studies that they can you know, accommodate in, in, in terms of uh, the mapping exercise. So those are the key, three key challenges that I can highlight at this point. Kiribin, you have? <laughs> yes. yes, thank you. Thank you, Karina. Um, well, uh, I mean, I'll start with what, what I've been working with at the moment and uh, natural capital accounting and natural capital accounts. Uh, that this is a, a new process and it's, it's, it's like, um, you know, um, it's just emerging and uh, there are just accounts being published at the moment. So some of the challenges uh, haven't really surfaced as yet. But um, I think in terms of interpretation of the information is, is, is important, the uptake of, of, of these uh, information presented in these accounts and the overall buy-in, you know, so uh, of, of these accounts. And so uh, I, we recently had a, a meeting with the, with the minister and uh, she, uh, she said, you know, it's, it's about the, the, uh, the evidence that the accounts presents. Does it present a depressing picture or not? And sometimes the reality is that it is a depressing picture. So it's about the, the interpretation of the accounts. It's about the narrative that goes with the accounts and how we can actually uh, um, use the, the information in, in the accounts that are, uh, that are presented in an objective manner to actually uh, communicate better and uh, communicate it in a more positive light. I don't know how that can be done, uh, but this is one of, the, one of the key challenges with national capital accounting. And then I mentioned another uh, tool, the summary for policymakers. And this is a, a mechanism that is being adopted by uh, science policy platforms, the IPCC the, um, and the IPES I mentioned. Um, but then again, um, you know, in terms of, uh, we speak about co-creation, co-development, but these uh, summary for policymakers are developed by the science by the, the experts and then hand it over to the uh, policymakers to say, okay, yeah, now go and comment. And then and coming back to what Mapula said is that do, uh, does the policymaker have time? And the answer is no. You give them a document like a summary for policymakers to comment and they will not comment. So it comes back to the experts that are providing the comments. And so that's, uh, that, I think largely that is one of our, our concerns. Thanks. Wonderful, Matt. 
Uh, Natalie, you have something? Yes, so I think in terms of the uh, responsive evidence synthesis services and offering this as one of the tools to support effective evidence informed decision making, I think a challenge that I would say that um, comes through in this tool is really around striking the balance between offering a diversity of products that you're able to produce and balancing that against the time and staffing um, resources that is required to produce that full range of um, products and services. I think especially when starting out, this is a really tricky balance to get right. So I would say that that is one of the biggest challenges when thinking about offering a res or making use of a res um, to support evidence-informed decision-making. Wonderful. Um, thanks. And I think I'm going to I'm going to read for you some of the questions that's coming from our attendees. And I think they they kind of all speak in in some ways also to challenges. Um, so one coming from Jeremy here in Ottawa who's asking, uh, he says, I can too easily imagine that appropriation models could be hijacked in highly charged issues as ideological. Uh, people try to pervert debate and mislead eventual policy views. So this is frankly normal in climate change discussions in, in North America and, and practically everywhere at, the, at, at practically every level. So how do you vaccinate the science policy interface against kind of organized bad actors? So that's one. Then I think are related also to challenges. Um, uh, Mapula, for you, have you experienced any tension between timeframes needed for evidence synthesis work and co-production processes and the urgent needs of policy areas for evidence? And if so, how, how do you manage that? And I think then also, a um, sorry, I should say that's from Anna and then from Kululeku, um, a question on uh, on building from this work, how many, how much of a priority is activism and translating knowledge from the perspective of ordinary citizens? As an example, how can we get more people involved in engaging more about the use of taxes as a punitive option in environmental conservation? And the second question is how do we navigate the role of political stumbling blocks and globalization in the context of environmental policy? I'm going to leave it to you. So, Mapula, there's a specific one to you, but the other two. Um, as you want to respond, panelists. Uh, Karina, I missed the second part. You said evidence synthesis and time. Uh, so, so if you, what is the, uh, the the tensions in your timelines between evidence synthesis, co-production, and then the urgent need uh, for evidence in a policy in a specific policy area. Okay, thanks. I think um, the, yeah, I don't know, Kari Kirubin is here, but from a, from a realistic point of view, um, you have to put an extra time, unfortunately, to, to try to balance um, the demand in terms of the co-production and the evidence synthesis. Um, and it's not easy because, for example, some of the functions that I perform are uh, regulated functions so then you have to prioritize um, in terms of um, what can I do today and you you try to say maybe I need to finish this other regulated function and these other ones that where we are still building evidence on uh, they are also still important because they are part of other discussions so it's not easy especially when you don't have a lot of uh, human resource capacities and you have to balance the the two so it's it's not easy I, I don't have the answer um but yeah it's it's, it's very difficult but with the with the with the partnership is if it's in place but also with the commitment as like i mentioned in our case we're talking about a long-term commitment journey that started earlier uh, even earlier than 2010 so the commitment becomes important as well but understanding that sometimes even that evidence itself is relevant even for other as, as Kirubin also highlighted sometimes in this engagement with the minister so it's, it's a balance that you have to find in your day-to-day -day and there's no recipe or textbook for that but uh, you have to find a way but if you value evidence it because then you can also see that it's helping you in strengthening your decision making then unfortunately you have to make that time available as well Thanks.
uh, can can I add to, to, to what Mapula is saying in terms of uh, timelines? I think, yeah, I mean, I, I also don't have the answers. And I think just from the experiences in the biodiversity sector, they, uh, you know, you evidence is, is needed almost yesterday and you almost have to have put on tap your your brains on the, on, on the on, uh, on the table because they want the, the evidence like yesterday and it almost always doesn't align with um, the policy um, um, policy pull uh, processes uh, so um, yeah I, I mean I think uh, it's it's about strengthening the evidence base having these tools in place, and uh, uh, constantly, you know, uh, marketing and um, these tools uh, with the decision makers, so that they they uh, uh, start to use it and apply it on a on a daily and uh, routine basis. So when uh, a policy question or, or, or anything um, uh, a need comes up, uh, the the tool or the evidence base is there. So it's it's about it's a process that is ongoing and as Mapul has indicated um, it's a partnership as well so um, you know having partnerships with academia so that you can you can actually access systems or um, or evidence mapping uh, and uh, log on yourself and, and actually uh, access the, the evidence uh, base and I think um, I may move on to the other question in terms of um, synthesizing, uh, you know, these diverse perspectives, um, it's part of the co-creation model. In, in terms of, um, you know, listening to the uh, the other side of of uh, or the uh, opposing sides, and this is also part of the, the negotiation process when you when it comes to climate change or even biodiversity as well. And we have this uh, all the time in. Um, uh, in the IPES uh, uh, circles, in the Convention on Biological Diversity negotiations, and, and at some point, you know, it, it it does you do reach consensus, but uh, it's not always. And um, but and and then obviously the, the international governance agenda also has um, their own agenda in the sense that they are time bound. You are there for a certain period. Um, and you have to negotiate, and it will, sometimes we sit up uh, two, three, four in the morning, uh, sitting and negotiating, and um, and then you get a deadlock, and then then you have the uh, the ministers and the uh, senior officials coming in to to unblock, uh, you know, the the negotiations. So it's a, it's a process of of bringing in uh, the di diverse views, and then at some point. Um, the regulatory mandate steps in, whether it is governments or it is um, NGOs or whoever it is, uh, they uh, um, uh, implement the mandate to actually take uh, the final decision. Uh, I, I think that's the, what I've got to say about uh, you know sanitizing uh, the process. To that. And the other questions I may have forgotten, but uh, let the other uh, colleagues. Uh, thanks. Uh, promise on that, do you have a, a quick response? Yeah. Um, I can um, after you promise. Go ahead. Right, this, this. Okay, no stress. Um, so I, I, I picked up on the, the question around vaccinating the process against bad actors, you know, the process of co-creating and working together. And it just struck me that um, in my limited experience, a large part of this co-creation model, you know, um, positioning um, EIDM in terms of relevance, credibility and uh, legitimacy from the decision makers perspective, I find that that attracts people who are more collaborative in terms of how they want to work. And so in my experience, we haven't, and, and perhaps other colleagues would probably have more experience of maybe that's a bit different. But I think that the, the way that we approach this work from a collaborative perspective attracts people with a, a like mind and a, a similar perspective. And I think that in itself, you know, working in a way that recognizes and respects and advocates for diversity of perspectives, um, you know, that in itself can to an extent vaccinate the process against 
you know, being hijacked mm -hmm. by, by nefarious characters. So that would be my input on that question. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Nasa. I think I will then respond to the other question that was posed by, if I remember correctly, Nkuli, around, um, you know, prioritizing citizens' uh, activism. Um, I think my, my quick response to that, I think, would be, um, you know, to, to, again, uh, it's, it's not really, I think, you might want to see this as a, as a missing piece of the puzzle. Yes, we've engaged policymakers in order to enhance the credibility, legitimacy, uh, and relevance. But I think, yeah, it's important. It's a very important point that we actually have things out there that we maybe participate in, you know, citizen dialogues, um, citizen panels in this whole process to enhance and then also, you know, to speak to those three uh, key domains that we that we have highlighted. So I think it, it, it is a priority. Yeah, and, and I think uh, citizen dialogues and panels will contribute quite a bit into the process. Wonderful, thank you. So I'm, I'm aware of time and that we, we're getting to the end of our time. So if, if okay, Michael, I think you have, Michael has a really relevant question. If okay with you panelists, I am going to email you that question and ask you with my WhatsApp number and ask you to do literally a one minute little video on Michael's question. And then I'm going to post it under the Twitter account. Um, hopefully, Michael, that, that we get a response because I think it's a really important one about uh, the nature of, of co-production um, and, and politics. Um, can I, as a quick wrap up then, each panelist, what is for you the key message you would like to have for people to take home today? Do you have like 30 seconds each? I can jump us off if that's okay. Uh, our, my core message would be that rigor and relevance are not mutually exclusive, and viewing them as such undermines effective evidence informed decision making. Promise? Yeah, I think, yeah, very related to what, what, what Natalie is saying. Uh, this process, rigor and relevance, complementary. Um, um, and we shouldn't have to choose between rigor and relevant research. Right, Kirbin? Uh, I think, I, I mean, I didn't get the question right, but I, I, I think it is about uh, rigor and uh, relevance. And I think it's uh, both are important. Um, we do uh, uh, pursue um, uh, science-based targets for a lot of our processes, uh, policy processes. But at the end of the day, uh, we have to, uh, it has to be relevant to society at large. So um, you have to integrate uh, the, the concerns and the, uh, it has to have a national relevance. Yes, thanks. Mapula? I think Mapula just- um, Thanks, yeah, I think <laughs> I'm still here. Yes, Mapula, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I was saying, I think for me, um, is to invite more and more researchers and, and policy actors and civil society actors to actively engage with the co-production because through it's, it's also about the process itself than the product that becomes relevant. So by engaging ourselves with our different views and, and preferences, by the end of the process, we are able most of the time to, to reach each other. So I find that being engaged in a co-production is valuable. Uh, even the evidence use itself already happens as the evidence synthesis takes place rather than waiting for a, a report to come out at the end. So I think I, it's just more encouraging more researchers um, to work with policy actors, but also wherever possible with society and, and private sector actors as well. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you very much from my side for, for our panelists. Um, really uh, wonderfully insightful um, tools you mentioning, uh, the how we can ensure that the research that is produced actually gets used um, in policy processes where we want it to make a real um, I'm going to hand over then to Jess to wrap up and remind us of the next. And, and thank you very much also for all the attendees for your presence today. Thanks very much, Karina and Cecilia, for sharing this session. Uh, and to all of our presenters today, uh, it was a, a really great uh, and engaging session. So a reminder that if you did ask a question and didn't get answered, um, our presenters will get these questions. And as Karina mentioned, she has a, a plan to, to post a video. So uh, we will follow up on those. 
Um, this webinar was recorded and added to our YouTube channel by tomorrow if you did miss anything. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and invite you to join us for the next session on March 9th, which will be comparing rapid and systematic review methods for environmental evidence, benefits, and limitations of different approaches. Uh, registration is now open on our website. Uh, thanks for joining and we'll see you next month. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. bye thanks, everyone.